Hi, everybody. Welcome to our workshop named Open Data for Learning Analytics. There is not much uh, content about educational context for today, only a few, and we are one of them. So it's good to have you here. Uh, we just want to underline the importance of open data for learning analytics and educational context. My name is Yasemin Gülbahar. Uh, I'm from Teachers College, uh, from the program of learning analytics. Uh, we will be presenting together with my colleagues, Katri and Megan today. Uh, in fact, I'm a visiting professor from Turkey. So, but this is my second year and I will be here for several years. So it's good to be here and talking about open data. So today, uh, first I will make a 10 minute uh, introduction to the content and maybe mention some of the possible research ideas. Then my colleagues will talk about an open data, uh, about the computer science education in New York. Then we will be having a group work. We will do a brainstorming session based on three scenarios we will uh, give to you. And then we will wrap up. I know you are tired. This is one of the last sessions, but I hope it will be good for you. OK, let me start with uh, mentioning the role of open data for learning analytics. So uh, as educators and researchers, we really uh, use uh, open data because it really provides a wealth of insight to this broad educational context here. There are several uh, roles maybe more than the ones that I will be mentioning here. But the first one is about accessibility and transparency. So uh, it's good to access open data and use it transparently so that we can uh, build up a data-driven culture and we can make decisions uh, on data. In terms of richness and diversity, we have a different uh, array and types of data, as you know, especially lately besides numbers we have audio and visual data so we started to talk and make research about multimodal learning analytics so we should be thinking about the multimodality here and in terms of fostering data literacy skills one of the panelists of today also mentioned that we are not teaching our kids from k through 12 about data literacy uh, so we should be teaching in the early ages and also we could be uh, inventing some of the ways to teach data literacy by the use of open data and also promoting reproducibility and innovation it's good to uh, it's good to uh, make replicable research and even to verify the research results or provide different aspects. So it's also important uh, in that case. And in terms of enhancing institutional effectiveness, of course, open data opens doors for institutions to uh, improve the effectiveness here. And uh, we are always talking about education, how to improve the education. We try to uh, provide quality education to all our children, but we have still some uh, obstacles to overcome. So uh, when we look at where the educational context intersects with the open data, we have at least three use cases here. The first one is uh, about educational landscape. We can have access to national, international level of data, and also we can use it from different levels, K through 12, higher education, adult education, and all through that levels. And as a second use case, we can talk about the education indicators. Oh yeah, this, this noise was distracting, thank you. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, as education indicators, you can see that we can talk about different types of schools, vocational schools and universities again, and we can uh, inform selection of the programs and even the providers curriculums here. 
And also we can use open data as educational resources, which is again very important because uh, sometimes we are having difficulty to find relevant data to come up with, the, uh, to use with the uh, different data mining techniques. In terms of these three use cases, it will be good to have the open data and from a different perspective from micro levels to uh, micro level, we can do countrywide, statewide or district-wide research at, in macro level, uh, like for example, college admissions, job preferences or dropout rates kind of uh, researchers. In meso level, we can make research, focus our research to schools, principals and teacher levels. We can figure out the uh, needs of teacher training or maybe the school climate, even the well-being uh, of the general, you know, teachers, principals and all the students school level. And uh, at micro level, we can concentrate more on the individual level, like uh, if our students have some learning disabilities or lacking motivation, um, we can uh, explore the effectiveness of instructional materials. But when we come from macro level to micro level, uh, if you realize the open data is mostly on the macro level and we need most individualized data for some other types of research here. So what are these other types of data we need? Besides administrative data that we can find easily uh, in the open data, we need behavioral and attitudinal data of our students. So administratively, we can identify at risk students, look at the general uh, academic performances, SAT scores, college admissions, this is okay. But when we have to make research more focused on the individual level, we have to analyze like student engagement in the courses, or if we are using different strategies, the effectiveness of these strategies, it can also uh, come up with good research. And also, uh, again, our students' perceptions, according to like, for example, STEM disciplines, computer science courses, new technologies, even data literacies, we have to be making research about all these aspects and so we need some different data here. And also, as I mentioned previously, we should be thinking we have very good uh, softwares or applications that really provides us with good visuals and analysis, but we also need some uh, software that makes data fusion based on some audio and video data or some kind of different even different kinds of data. So we could be thinking about all of this, you know, even the oxygen level in the classroom is affecting how we learn, the effectiveness of our uh, learned capacity or the sleeping disorders. Anything like that could really be uh, helping our research. So, we also have the machine learning the algorithms and very powerful techniques uh, to mine data, as you know. But again, it's really difficult to find the appropriate data to use with that specific kind of data mining techniques. Uh, maybe some of them are more easy, but for like if we need time series or personalized data, or personalized data in a longitudinal sense, we have to be finding that kind of data and otherwise we cannot invent new techniques and approaches to analyze this data. So at this point, uh, I just want to mention that yes, we are doing our best with the research, with informing the society for public good but uh, this is just few of the infinite uh, possibilities of research we can do 
performance analysis on educational programs. We can look at the level of equity in education, to what extent we are uh, just providing the equal access to our students in terms of internet, technology access, or even computer science courses, data literacy courses. And also we could do something about effectiveness of resource allocation. We can, we always do predictive analytics for student success. And uh, also we can do some learning environment optimization because not all the environments, even online or uh, in person are not equipped with uh, equal opportunities. So we can also look for community and family engagement and need for teacher professional development, impact of extracurricular activities in schools provided, even the clubs, impact of digital divide on our students starting from the early ages, the personalized education and there were several uh, sessions about the generative AI, you know that they are using generative AI for their homeworks, for everything, for informing and learning. So there should be some risks. There could be some risk that we have to know and maybe take some precautions about. So ethical computing also very important, the ethical dimension of what we are doing. So there are many, many other research. So I want to just say that uh, we need open data for open science, for learning from our research and informing the public. So now I want to give the floor to my colleagues uh, because they will be talking about uh, their analysis. Okay. All right, so hello everybody. Hi, my name is Catherine Rojas. I am a learning analytics student at Teachers College and with me today I have I'm Megan. I'm also a master's learning analytics student at Teachers College. And then today we'll be presenting a snapshot of computer science education from 2015 to 2022. So before we get started um, going a deep dive into all of like, the data that we were able to collect um, and analyze, our research focuses on the CS for All initiative uh, that, began in, that began in 2015 with the goal of all New York City public schools receiving meaningful, high quality computer science education um, at each school level. So that's uh, elementary school, middle school, and high school by 2025. Um, and so when we started our project, we were thinking uh, the data that was available, uh, like the professor was saying, was is at a very macro level. We're also very interested in more micro and meso levels, but the data is not available for those things. Um, so we wanted to look at from a district-wide level, a city-wide level, are students learning computer science? Is it equitable? Because when students are, are studying computer science, they're not just learning the hard skills, they're learning soft skills that they can use away from the computers. And if that access isn't distributed equitably, um, the outcomes won't be equitable either. And then uh, for the first couple slides, I will speak on how have the demographics of students taking computer science changed over a period of time, as well as computer science courses, course offerings, how they differ by borough. And then Megan will. And then the last two research questions that we had were a little bit more um, infrastructure, the, the resources, focused on the resources. So we wanted to investigate the relationship between school bandwidth and computer science course offerings, as well as whether the number of STEM teachers in a school impacted or had a correlation with the number of computer science courses offered. Okay, so before we get started on sharing our findings, here is a snapshot of the data sets used from Open Data as well as New York City Public Schools Info Hub. Um, we looked at reports from 2015 to 2022, and that totaled about 28 CSV, well, about seven <laughs> um, spreadsheets, and then uh, 28 individual CSVs within that data set. Um, and then right here on the right, you can see that we merged all of them, categorized them by year as well as by category type so you'll see the different demographics there as well as a lot more information and then on the bottom data set that we compiled shows all the variables that we looked at for bandwidth computer science course offerings as well as stem teachers 
So for our first finding, we looked at grades and computer science classes. So on average, in 2015 to, to 2016, there was 4.65% of students across all grades who took computer science classes. In 21-22, we found that 18.42% of students took a computer science class across all grade levels. As you can see from the chart, if we separate that a little bit more, you can see that K through five is kind of leading the charge in terms of like the most number of students taking computer science courses. Uh, and this may be due to the structure of elementary education, which allows for computer sciences, computer science courses to be integrated as a special into their curriculum versus when you look at grade six through eight or nine through 12, those might be separate electives that students would have to opt into. Um, however, this data did not include any information regarding uh, the number of students served uh, within each class size, within each class only that the class was offered um, and also didn't include the quality of the courses. Continue on with demographics, we then kind of pivoted a little bit and started looking at New York City districts. We had 231 values of district data and as you can see on the first graph on, I guess, my, your left mind, <laughs> um, you can see that the district with the most students taking computer science classes was District 26 in Queens with an average of 33% of students over the seven year period taking computer science classes. Uh, then you have District 31 in Staten Island with 21% of students taking computer science and then District 25 in Queens, back again in Queens, 19.7% uh, uh, of the students were taking computer science classes. So you can feel free to see your community school district and see how computer science um, how, how many students are taking computer science classes in your district and again over the seven year span. One thing I would like to know is that um, the districts with uh, the lowest numbers were district 17 and 75. They both had negative coefficients which suggests a decrease in the students taking computer science classes. So those particular neighborhoods would be like Prospect Heights, East Flatbush and Crown Heights and then district 75. Uh, does provide highly specialized instruction, no support for students. In the second graph, you can see kind of a similar trend with Staten Island kind of <laughs> leading in terms of the percentage of students taking computer science classes and then Queens. But one interesting thing that we saw was in the Bronx over the seven year period, the Bronx had the most growth, although it was the, the borough with the least number of what well, the least percentage of students taking computer science classes. A couple of other demographics that we looked at. Um, when looking at English versus non-English language learners, we have a steady increase and the percentage actually equalized around 2020, 2021, about during the pandemic and then shifted. Um, so then you saw that there were more English language learners taking computer science versus non-English language learners. Uh, the same trend ended up occurring with uh, the economically disadvantaged and non-economically -eco disadvantaged groups where the overall number um, was decreasing into the pandemic and then both demographics kind of had a switch um, where economically disadvantaged students took the lead by 1%. Then we have, we started looking at gender and then with, with gender, you can see males still lead the charge when it comes to computer science classes and they had a steady 1%. That 1%, there are about a million students that take that, that are in the New York City public school system. So you could say about 100,000 more male students than female students are taking computer science classes. When it comes to race, we had just a general increase across all groups. The one that kind of caught our eye a little bit more was the multiracial group, um, where they had a very big significant dip during the pandemic around 2020, 2021. And then they had, um, and then in 2020, yeah, 2020 to 2021, and then they had an increase um, in 21, 22. And then lastly, students without disabilities take the most computer science classes. But one interesting thing that we found was that the gap between the two groups from 2015 to 2019 was increasing every year by 1%. So you would find that gap from 1% to 4% in 2019. And then in 2020 to 2022, that gap started closing up again. Um, so I don't know what happened during the pandemic for accessibility for students with disabilities, but it was great because we had more students um, taking computer science classes and that gap went down from 4% to 1%. And then for our second question, 
Um, we looked at do computer science courses, course offerings differ by borough. These are the average number of computer science courses per school by borough that were offered each year. These averages are for schools that offered computer science courses. And the number of schools offering computer science courses has increased about by about 500 schools from 2015 to 2022. So if when you're reading this chart, it kind of looks like that there's a decrease in the number of computer science classes, but there's not, it's kind of normalizing a little bit. So when reading this chart, you can see that if you look for a school um, with that has a computer science course offering, like for example, the green line with Brooklyn, um, you'll find that on average, you'll see in that general area about three computer science courses. And then now I will forward it along to Megan uh, for our next two research questions. Um, and so the next research question was uh, about the relationship between the bandwidth that a school has and their computer science course offerings. Uh, and as you can see, s since the program started on the top left here, there's been a steady increase in bandwidth in, that schools have over time, which makes sense. Um, schools on, a, uh, on average have about 300 megabytes per second of data, I mean of bandwidth. And then down here, we looked at we included all computer science classes here, I mean, all schools, and even the ones that didn't offer computer science. And you can see that the computer science classes offered per school year, the range is increasing. The first two years, almost everybody didn't offer computer science, and now we're up to about, uh, around 75% of schools offering somewhere between zero and three, but there still are a great many schools that aren't offering computer science at all. Um, and so what this chart is showing us is that bandwidth and computer science cor uh, course offerings didn't really have a correlation. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and so the next question, we wanted to look at whether the number of STEM teachers in a school in a given year correlated to the number of computer science classes offered. And what we found is that since the beginning of the program, the number of STEM teachers at schools hasn't changed. Um, but you would think if you were trying to promote an initiative to get more computer science courses, you might need more STEM teachers. Um, and then what we found is that over the that overall, the schools with the highest number of STEM teachers are the schools that cater to older students. And this is because elementary school teachers teach all the subjects, so they don't have a STEM license per se. All right, and so then we plotted the two against each other. And what we found um, was that there is a weak correlation between the number of students that a school has and the number of computer science courses they offer, as well as the number of AP computer science courses they offered, which was surprising to us, because you would think there would be greater need with more students. Um, and then the number of full-time STEM teachers had a weak correlation with the number of computer science classes, but a moderate correlation with the number of AP computer science courses offered, which uh, is something that we would like to investigate further because uh, that could be an equity issue. Okay, and so then we were just curious to look and see, um, since we know that the number, the number of STEM teachers has a moderate correlation with AP courses offered. It's not surprising then that Staten Island offers the most AP courses in computer science per school. You can see they also have the most students. And so this graph just details that. Um, we did look into the amount of STEM teachers per student for all of the boroughs except for the Bronx. It's about one uh, STEM teacher for every 60 students. For the Bronx, it's more like one for every 55 students. And then our conclusions and future work. So the first thing that we wanted to say is that, you know, it's amazing that the open data exists. We're hoping that as time goes on and schools get more comfortable releasing this open data, the data can be more complete and uh, more interoperable. Right now, that's something, uh, that was something that we had a difficulty with in our research. Um, we also would like to see more attitudinal data, uh, <clears throat> attitudinal data and behavioral data um, attitudinal data could be things like, why are students not taking computer science classes, right? We don't, we couldn't find data sets about how full the computer science classes were, wh whether there were waiting lists for computer science classes, um, 
what types of children chose them outside of demographic information. Um, and so uh, there was about nine years ago, a study uh, by Google and Gallup, and they found that students overwhelmingly believe that computer science classes are only things that smart kids should, can take, that they're, it's not a creative field, it's not innovative, it doesn't do anything for the public good. And all of those are things that if we had more research on in New York City, we could address. Um, we're also interested in behavioral data. That would be things like, what's the, uh, what's the quality of the teachers who are in the computer science classes? How are they being promoted? And then future outcomes. What does, does a student taking a computer science class in high school actually influence their future career outcomes? We don't have that data right now, um, but it would be helpful. And then in, as far as additional research, we're interested in using this information and merging it together with some of the other NYC open data data sets to find out how funding affects CS uh, course offerings, to find out um, if we could classify schools by their different characteristics in order to predict whether they would have a computer science class offered or not. Okay, and that was our research. Thank you so much for for listening, yes. and then we'll pivot back to Professor Uma. Okay. So in terms of the demographics, there were different things that we came up with, such as the socioeconomic status, ethnic group they belong to, uh, religious background, the education of both the parents and the children where they currently were, the languages, were they one language, multi-languages in the household, um, and then we also thought about their cognitive status uh, in terms of, you know, whether, say for instance, the children were autistic, there is a spectrum for that. Uh, if they had things like attention deficit disorder, uh, also the parental influence and the peer influence on the child. So these were things that we started to discuss, and then we realized that it was gonna lead us down to rabbit holes, infinitum. So we had to limit ourselves. <laughs> Uh, she just passed the, the microphone to me. <laughs> um, so forgive me if I seem a little uh, So our second point was uh, how would the data be treated if there were marginal groups? Um, for example, students having language barriers or learning difficulties, gifted kids. Um, so one of the points that I think one of my members had uh, brought up was, uh, I think this microphone died? No, no, it's clear. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. No, no, it's, it's it's kind of going in now. Oh, oh, I promise that it impresses me. Oh no, it's okay. I, uh, I mean. No, it's all good. I, I don't want to speak on the microphone anyway. But it's all good. <laughs> 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 it's all good. Okay. It's okay. okay. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just keep talking. Okay. Um, so one of the ways, or at least one of my group members, or maybe I'm just making this up um, as we go along. Um, we can just group them together and see what motivates them to. Uh, to make the decisions that they make. So for example, gifted students, what is it? We can group them together and see what is it, what commonalities that they have that make them what they are. And on the opposite end of the road, um, we can see what commonalities do students who struggle go through. So maybe so socioeconomic um, uh, issues, maybe uh, parents or cultural, um, maybe problems at home, et cetera, et cetera. Um, as well as learning difficulties. What are the commonalities that we see in that group? And then we can just group them together and then find out more information that way. Um, the last bullet point I see, I will uh, hand to my colleague right here. Um, the last bullet point we talked about was how will the data be treated if there are outliers in the data? and to what extent will the results of analysis be reliable with or without outliers. And uh, honestly, on this point, we kind of struggled to come to a complete consensus mm -hmm. about whether or not to include the outliers. Um, obviously, if we're talking about finding averages or means in the data, um, we probably don't want outliers, but at the same time, these outliers are students. 
who still need after school activities. So ignoring them isn't really a like yeah, it's not really the, the best outcome either. So we kind of struggle to figure out how how we can include them without skewing data, but also actually provide answers to help the students. Um, if anyone else in the room has an idea, you're more than welcome to that. <laughs> yes, of course. The other groups can uh, share their thoughts if you have. But these were very uh, valuable insights. Good discussion. Thank you so much. Good. Is there like an answer key that we can look at? <laughs> no, this is a brainstorming session, so that we will open our mind. Oh, yeah. I'm not trying to be the best Based on today's discussion, of course. Yeah, I thought there was a right one. No, no, no. There's some extra frustration in education data analysis. <laughs> yes. You can tell I'm used to multiple choice questions. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. So. Let's continue with the second scenario. Oh, that's us. Oh, the last oh, one. Okay. Oh, I can read it. Okay. Hello. Anne. Anne Slee, a middle school language teacher, is worried. Yeah, you're right. It does. <laughs> is worried about some of her students that they will possibly fail the course. She thinks that either they are not motivated to learn, or they lack access to instructional materials, technology, internet, or similar necessary learning resources. This, uh, the causes may also be due to some challenges about transportation, the quality of food provided at the school, the physical conditions of learning environments, etc. Uh, do I have to read the questions or just the scenario? You can also go with the questions because we will provide answers. Okay, so a uh, few questions that we had are what are the possible causes of low grades and performance in any course? How can we reveal these potential accessibility obstacles students face and what kind of data and sources can help Ansley figure out the problem? Mm -hmm. Okay, I guess I'll answer too. Do you guys want to chime in and understand anything? Okay. Um, so a few things that we came up with in the discussion were um, maybe looking at zip codes and um, kind of more of a um, individualized level, seeing the income in these zip codes, also seeing if they're English um, as a second language students, also uh, some sort of method that the teacher could do to measure motivation would be maybe serving the students to see if they're interested in or not also um just like gather like information on seeing the quality of grocery stores available and there's of codes uh their educational level of the parents and seeing so, you know there's a correlation between socioeconomic status and number of food pantries in the area uh somebody mentioned in my group uh dollar general and areas um, see if there's a collision between that and um, supermarkets. Also, just the potential of cutting school budgets could also be uh, an effect of this. Also, the methodology of the teacher. It could be teaching too broad uh, versus more um, interactive. Also, just the students not maybe being completely literate at home or their family. And then having just the use of Google Classroom and kids getting Chromebooks, which is, could be different. There's also difference in um, how students uh, may use the tablets versus the desktop, so also the type of technology available, and also maybe just not being knowledgeable on how to use the internet. <laughs> so maybe I could wrap up saying that based on all of this, maybe like more than 20 variables, yes, we can be able to decide about the possibility of failure of success of students but still uh, we could be uh, making wrong predictions and we should yeah, be very awesome. careful okay thank you so much and we are running out of time so let's just move to the third scenario <laughs> okay um cool uh, so i'll just sum up our scenario and some of the discussion <laughs> topics that mm -hmm. we had around it um, so our scenario was about Casey who's working at this school, um, students from different countries and might not have English as their first language, and I think they're trying to tackle 
this, um, I guess, question of like how to come up with like different clusters of different groups of students, um, when thinking about like cultural differences and habits. So we talked about different things you could consider when it comes to data. Um, a lot of things I've already mentioned, like household size and income, socioeconomic status. Um, but I think some that were interesting related to our topic were maybe like if they were the first, second, or third sibling. Um, we talked about some like our personal experiences of like maybe not native like uh, English speakers um, and, and how like different uh, I guess like siblings could grow out of that at different stages in life, depending on, I guess, like how they were parented as well. So thinking about like the number of siblings in a household, um, we discussed maybe also like um, like access to like internet and like media, and that would kind of affect how like students are, I guess, like intaking um, things like culturally and how they approach school as well, uh, and then. We talked about things that might not be as easy to collect data on, like maybe like as early child education, like how observing how where students play, and if that has any correlation to um, the like areas that they're interested in or um, what they excel at like, later on in mm -hmm. their like uh, schooling. Um, and then so that helped us to think about what different clusters we could come up with and um, what we could have done with that and. I guess the main takeaway was that if we have these clusters, we can hopefully kind of tailor instruction to um, kind of meet the needs of like different groups. Um, and we also talked about some like ethical considerations, and we didn't want to use that to, I guess, limit opportunities, but rather just make sure that we're like making sure there's more options for, for students, and I guess addressing any, any gaps that are in those groups. Yes, very good. Thank you so much. Okay. I hope we were able to make you think about this complex and big system. Uh, in fact, we based our this workshop on strategic initiative 11. Uh, so it says that we have to create case studies and presentations to share how open data can improve service delivery, promote equity and increase efficiency. So all together we will use open data and improve open science. Thank you for your contribution and thank you for being here.